What we're talking about, the name of this scientifically, is fluorescence. So fluorescence, you can see this in natural materials, and I guess this is appropriate. When you apply high energy light, so say a UV light, which is above the visible light, it'll induce the movement of electrons of certain what we call activators. These are elements that just happen to have the right electron config configuration for UV energies. In other words, you know, just a little bit above visible light. And um, I keep meaning to try to set up a case for us to do this again, but I have a, a black light downstairs. I can do this with some specimens. Some specimens do this better than others, and it's elements like zirconium and titanium that do this really well. Some of the rare earths, so like the lanthanides, will do this. Not every crystal will do this, and it has to incorporate a small amount of these contaminants, if you will, in order to show this off. But this was a case, I think this is from the uh, Amherst collection, uh, and one of my former students took a picture of it that turned out rather nicely. But you can see this effect. This, this is not the real color of the material. This is a fluoresced color, a signal. And the wavelengths that are being fluoresced are a function of the electrons moving in the contaminants in these individual crystals, the activators. So we can take advantage of that. We know that any light that we get off of this is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And fluorescing means doing any of this. Although it's much easier to measure the higher energies you get because then it gets less messy. The instrument I want to talk about actually plays around with the visible infrared, which is on the other side, and ultraviolet sides of the visible spectrum, which is kind of messy, but it's easy to get at. It uh, requires a lot less effort. There are other instruments out there that are much uh, more difficult to run, but uh, do similar things with x-rays and ultraviolet rays, higher end ultraviolet rays. All of these are just ways to characterize what's going on with the electron jumps. In other words, can the individual electron structure of an atom tell us what atoms are there? Again, what do we want to do? We want to apply these to the atoms that are present in our minerals. Um, basically, what we do to do this is separate them. And we do this through spectrometry. Spectrometry just means separate out the wavelengths when you're talking about energy spectrometry. And some of the early experiments on this basically illustrate what I want to talk about. For instance, if you had a vessel of hydrogen and you got it hot enough so that the electrons got really excited, so that they move around a lot, well they're going to emit light. You can actually see it's kind of a bright light if you get it real hot, you don't want to look at it. Very bright light. And if you send that through a slit and then through a prism, this is you know just like Newton's prism where he broke visible light into all its rainbow components. Turns out you don't get a rainbow from it. Hydrogen gives you four distinct lines. So one in red, one in green, and two in violet, or one in indigo and one in violet, depending on how you like to break up the, the rainbow. It's a continuum, so the names are kind of arbitrary, but we do have bins that we stick each of the colors in. So it turns out when you heat hydrogen, you get four spectral lines. And in fact, if you don't know you have hydrogen in the vessel, say somebody gave you an unknown gas in a vessel and you got it hot, you could determine it was hydrogen by doing this. The, those lines are not arbitrary. They occur at the same point in terms of frequency and wavelength, so they are measurable phenomena. And it continues on. There are infrared lines. Of course, you can't see them because they're infrared and your eyes are only sensitive to this series of wavelengths. And ultraviolet being, uh, being emitted by this. I like uh, going to some of the chemistry websites out there because these spectra are kind of uh, the signature of all these elements and they like to highlight that. So again, I said they're not arbitrary, in fact they have specific wavelengths, these are the wavelengths here. So wavelengths are measured in lengths and they're very tiny lengths, so we're dealing with nanometers, small fractions of a meter. Uh, we can also catch these in frequencies, which means how long it takes for the waveform to repeat itself. And those are listed in hertz, which is one cycle. You don't need to know any of this. I just want you to realize that those four numbers are the same for any hydrogen. Uh, how can we get that stuff hot? Well, there's a lot of ways you can do it. One of the popular ways now is to send materials through what's called an inductively coupled plasma. Basically, it uses a charge to ionize everything. that produce, And if you're shooting argon through at the same time, you get a nice flame. And you strip off all the electrons, and you wait for them to come back. So you can do this for hydrogen or any element, and it will have fun. 
The problem with this is you could do this very easily if you uh, break uh, the materials again down in an acid and shoot them through. But if you want to leave things in place, and you don't want to take a whole bunch of material, then you need something that will operate on a smaller scale. These are those spectral lines that are characteristic, and I got those from a chemistry website. Some of them use them as background, they're very pretty. Um, but hydrogen, again, the four lines, two violet or an indigo and a violet. Mercury, by comparison, there's some similarities, which actually can cause a problem if you're trying to measure it. If you have overlapping lines, that's actually a problem. You have to resolve that. But nonetheless, there's some distinctive things in mercury that tells me it's not hydrogen, it's mercury. Neon here, that's the light that you see in the uh, beer signs, right? That and a number of other noble gases to make those different colors. They make those different colors because of this, because of the colors they emit when they're hot. So it's a trick of getting the neon hot to make the light so that you can advertise your, your beers. Uh, you can look at them two ways. This is known as emission spectrum. When you look at the lines that are being emitted, you can also look at absorption spectrum because it works in reverse. It's the photoelectric effect in uh, reverse. You can actually take out those energies as you pass them through these materials. I won't spend too much time on that because it's not the mode I work in. But if you're familiar with the kind of spectral assessment they make on stars and the sun to understand what's in those bodies, they actually do it through this. They see what's being removed from the spectrum. And it's just backwards from that. You can see the lines correspond, the missing points correspond with that. So again, we want to ask questions of individual grains that are on a centimeter or smaller scale, and maybe we want to actually look down on, on even smaller scales as they grow. So we want to be down on the micron scale. Unfortunately, like I said, in the last 30 years, we've come up with some powerful tools to do this. Uh, one of them being the ability to shoot electrons on a very focused plane. So particle beams, very useful for, for interacting with samples. Electrons being the easiest one to manipulate. We actually have an electron microscope on this floor, and it operates on this principle. It shoots electrons at a sample at a very high potential or voltage. And the electrons get excited, and you can even make some determinations based on what wavelengths you see. And in fact, that works in the X-ray spectrum, so they're very distinct looking lines from that. Uh, another way to do it is Star Wars, light beams, laser fire. Just basically sending energies down there to do the job of ionization. And the reason why I wanted to show you what ICP was about is because basically you're doing this kind of trick, getting things very hot and ionized over a very, very small space. A micron size space, actually a hundred micron size space, something like that. But nonetheless, you can use lasers, high energy lasers, focus that energy on a small point, and ionize the snot out of whatever you want to look at. So what you're doing is you're actually jettisoning a lot of particles here. They've lost a lot of their electrons in the process. They're going to get them back, don't worry. When they get them back, they're going to emit light characteristic of the ions that are present in that specimen, the individual elements that are present in that specimen. So that's what we do downstairs. I've got this instrument called the LIBS, which is an acronym for Laser Induced Breakdown Spectrometer. It took me like a year to remember that's <laughs> the B is breakdown. Now, breakdown just means we're actually going to ionize everything in it, but it's a laser ablation technique. In other words, we are ablating the sample. Um, depending on who you read, it's either a uh, low damaging or non-destructive method, but it does leave a, a hole. I'll show you some of the holes. It leaves a hole, so I sometimes have people come in and ask me, can you tell if this is a real diamond, which I can on this instrument, but it does mean that I'm going to put a small hole in there. And, and some people are less, they particularly don't want it on the face. If I, if I do it, i got to do it on the backside, and that's kind of, kind of hard to do. So. Um, what is it? It's an instrument bought off uh, as a commercial product, but if you've fussed around with analytical instruments, you know that that's a highly specified device because they don't have a huge market share for this. But it's basically the kind of laser they use to etch things. It's the kind of laser they use for eye surgery. It's just nicely packaged into an instrument with a microscope and a series of spectrometers, seven of them, that allow me to spread out the light that's being generated and that's what it looks like when the laser hits the sample. Again, remember what we're doing here. We are basically kicking out a bunch of particles that are, are the result of being hit by the laser, 
They're getting very hot, they're getting electrons, and they're creating what we call a plasma cloud. We look at that light in a short period of time and we see it. So uh, it's a fairly high energy laser that operates in the UV wavelengths. So you can't see the laser light. And that's a good thing because it would hurt your eyes. But more importantly, this is what we call a class one laser device. Everything is nicely contained. You can't operate the machine and be able to see the light from it. And again, that's a good thing. Uh, by default, it has these one and two inch sample formats that make uh, sample preparation somewhat more cumbersome than it could be, but nonetheless, it's pretty low preparation compared to some of the other techniques that are out there. So the process, again, is, is basically laser energy hits the sample, it heats a very small volume, and you specify how big you want that volume to be by telling you how big to make the spot size. Uh, under that heating, you get volatilization or ablation of the material, it goes down to a certain depth. The plasma generates above it, so as that material cools, it starts to emit light, and then that light can be broken down for spectral analysis. What you're left with is a hole. Sometimes they're nice looking holes, sometimes they're not so nice, right? You can't, you can't always see them. These were some nice looking holes from some of Kerry's work last year. Uh, these are made in selenite, so because it's a nice clear crystal and the energetics were favorable, you can see that the hole itself, it's this this thing right here is really nice looking. And then you have what we call the ejection blanket around it. This is material from the plasma that has come down, much like a crater on the moon. It's basically the debris field from blasting out a small portion of that. So again, relatively non-destructive. These are small. These are The target size was 70 microns. And if you measured one of these, it's on the scale of 100 microns. And they're not very deep. They go down a few nanometers, and that's about it. All right. Laser ablation techniques are tricky. This isn't the only one on the market, and all of them have this problem. It's basically, it's about getting the laser to couple with the sample. So it depends on sample geometry, spot size, power, statistical significance. I've had two UGRO students working on this so far, and we've made great advances in understanding our instrument. But it is an instrument by instrument problem. You have to assess your own instrument first. So we spend a lot of time figuring out what works for making successful analyses with the things that we've looked at. Carrie's done a lot of work last year trying to make sense of the signals we're getting out. The raw signal, because you have seven different spectrometers, actually has offsets in what we call the background values. In spectrometry, there's no such thing as zero. You've always got energies out there because there's energy throughout our universe. Uh, some of the sources in our, that contaminate our backgrounds are lighting on the sample because any visible light or infrared heat where UV is going to add to our, our background. And also there's some breaking radiation, that is radiation as the energies are being distributed from atom to atom, some of that is lost in the process. So both of those contribute to the stair step problem in the background that elevates the non-peak values off of zero. We're really only interested in the peak values because those correspond to the individual atoms we're looking for. So we'd like these at zero, the way to get around this is basically to trick the instrument, tell it we're going to collect a spectrum while we're not firing the laser, and look then, and then subtract those values away. And you can see the resulting spectra is peaks, some of them are, are fairly complex peaks, above a background value that averages on plus or minus three counts around zero. This is a counting mechanism, so basically it's like a, the spectrometer is like a camera in the sense that it has pixels on it that are sensitive, a CCD. They just sit there and they count how many photons they get by converting that to an electron charge. It's the photoelectric effect all over again. It amplifies that signal, but nonetheless, it's a counting phenomenon. You are expecting one count for every electron jump. Of course, it's a little messier than that, but nonetheless, bigger peaks correspond to one, concentrations of those elements, and two, the ability for those energies to propagate in your medium. One thing that's difficult about this is each sample has its own sort of signal and intensity, 